Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's another weekend of uh, this brilliant show. As usual, uh, our partner in crime is uh, is away, but uh, he sends his regards. Uh, today we have uh, a senior in the house, and um, because it's his moment, I want him to take away from here. Senior, introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me in your show. Uh, I am Chacha Odera, presently senior partner in the law firm of Oraro and Company Advocates. Ah, great. So, and uh, so that we take this as... Tell us, how did the journey begin? Uh, for example, uh, where did you grow up? Okay. Um, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, yeah. uh, 1964, just soon after independence, yeah. but as I say, before Kenya, became a republic. Yeah. One thing which many Ke people don't know is that Kenya became a republic in 1964, whereas we got our independence in 1963, we were still under the dominion of the Queen of England. Yeah. And uh, that's how come we had our first Prime Minister, Jomo Kenyatta, as a Prime Minister and not as a President. Yeah. And it's only when we declared a republic in 1964 that yeah. we had our first President. Yeah. So. I grew up in Nairobi, went to school in Nairobi, and uh, went to St. George's Primary School. Thereafter, I was up in Lenana High School. That's between 1982. We can't trust this. <laughs> so, you grew up in Nairobi. Yes. St. George's is uh, near State House. Yes, it's on, uh, it used to be what is called the Caledonia Road. Now it's uh, Dennis Street Road. Road. Yes. Ah. And uh, so that, because you need, uh, we, as we're having our informal conversation, you told me you lived a few blocks away from uh, Nani Mongai. Yes, I grew up in Nairobi West. Yes. Uh, what was referred to, and I think it's still referred to as Tyson's Estate. Uh -huh. That's right next to Mombasa Road. Yeah. Uh, at that particular time, the place was not very uh, populated. It was a very, what one would say, sparsely populated place. Yeah. So one of the first estates which were built in that area yeah. was by the developer Tyson. Uh, that's how come the estate was called Tyson's, Tyson's. estate. Yeah. And uh, so in primary school, uh, you see, I grew up in a generation where our foxes tell me I was always number one in primary school. <laughs> so were you, were, you that, were you that kind of kiddo? No, no, no. The person who was always number one yeah. in primary school was... Uh, Richard Ndungu, Arbi Ndungu, uh -huh. uh, you may recall, for a long time he was a partner at KPMG. Yeah. And uh, he was always number one yeah. in primary school. Yeah. Uh, number two and three position was yeah. interchanged yeah. by a lady who was called uh, Janeta Wimbo. Yeah. And interchanged with Seda Ogada. Mm -hmm. Seda Ogada is presently the general counsel at the IMF. Ah, okay. And uh, he has a very interesting story of yeah. how he ended up both at uh, Harvard University, where he studied his law, mm -hmm. boasting of uh, Barack Obama as one of his classmates. Oh. Uh, Maina Kiai. Yeah. And I think Kiraito Murungi was also in exile then and took a course oh. at uh, Harvard, <coughs> Harvard University. Yeah. Yes. So I was never number one. <laughs> Though, uh, <coughs> the other day I was looking at my report cards and I, was an, I had an interesting history in terms of ranking. I would always start the first term mm -hmm. of any year, both primary and secondary school. Yeah. And both primary and secondary, the class had about 30 to 35 people. Yeah. And oftentimes, first term, I would always be in the 20s. Mm -hmm. But by third term, mm -hmm. I was between number four, five, six. Yeah. So it was always, as I say, yeah. I was a typical Kenyan, yeah. I was a marathoner. Yeah. I didn't start with a sprint. Yeah. I started, but by the end of uh, the year, yeah. when it actually mattered, because yeah. it was your ranking in third term that determined whether you're getting a prize yeah. or not. Yeah. And um, so you, you get done with primary school. Um, was Lenana School your first choice? Yes, Lenana. Mm -hmm. It was an interesting uh, tradition that we had in, pr in schools then. Yeah you found that uh, depending on what primary school one was, mm -hmm. that would by and large inform the school you would pick for your secondary school. Yeah. 
Like in Lenana School, when we were admitted at Form 1, yeah. we were 140 of us. Yes. And out of those 140, mm -hmm. 10 of us were from St. George's Primary School. Ah, okay. Uh, Nairobi Primary used to have a number of people going to Nairobi School. Yeah. So was, I think, Westlands Primary. Yeah. But uh, St. George's, the destination of choice was Lenana. Yeah. So Lenana was my first choice. Yeah. And uh, uh, by God's grace, I did make it to Lenana School. Yeah. So in, uh, you guys call it Labon? We call it, uh, it's changes. Yes. But uh, the old boys yes. are Libons. Libons. But the generation before us, yeah. they are called Yorkists. Oh. Because Lenana yeah. was founded in 1949 yeah. as Duke of York. Yes. And it only changed to Lenana, I believe around 1972, when then uh, we were Africanizing a lot of... Uh, were Africanizing the names that we gave our schools. Ah. Schools like Jamhuri High School was yeah. called Duke of Gloucester. Yeah. State House, I think, was also Duchess of Gloucester. Yeah. Uh, Nairobi School was Prince of Wales. Yeah. So a time came after independence when uh, we were now uh, adopting African yeah. names, or so names that we could relate to as a country. Yeah. So Lenana became Prince of, uh, sorry, Duke of York became Lenana. Yeah. And as uh, you might recall from your history, yeah. Lenana was a Libon, yeah. uh, a Maasai leader. Yeah. And uh, that's how come the old boys of Lenana refer to themselves as Libons. Uh, but when we were in school, yeah. as students, we, Lenana went by the Monica Changes, yeah. and Nairobi school was Patch. Yeah. And why we were called changes, mm -hmm. uh, there are many stories out there. Yeah. Some people say that there was a hit, a hit song which was called Changes and the flip side of it was called Patch. Mm -hmm. So we looked at each other as a flip side of one another. <laughs> the other people, some other people have, of the school of thought yeah. that <clears throat> Lenana changed people. There were people who, mm, okay, yeah, I you see. know, yeah. Uh, we came from various and varied backgrounds, yeah. diverse backgrounds. Yeah. And even those who may have come from a rural setup came yeah. into Lenana mm -hmm. and were quickly, uh, you know, urbanized. Yeah. So they would say, change, Lenana changes people. Yeah. Yes. Ah. So, fun, let me tell you a funny story. For the longest time in the show, we've always had guys from... Uh, I was in Alliance. <laughs> 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 so today... At yes. least we have, uh, we have a change. Yes. So, in, uh, when you get to Lenana, are you playing any sports at this time? Well, we all had to play sports. Yeah. I got into Lenana in 1977, yeah. and we all had to play sports, yeah. whether you are good at it or you are not good at it. Yeah. For those people who are good at it, uh, they got it a little better and easier because yeah. they were the blue-eyed boys, yes. and they earned their place at the table. Yeah. I must say that uh, I was not particularly a sports, a sports fellow, though I had great interest in following sports. Yeah. The only game I would say I ever played at the school level yeah. was cricket. Cricket. Yes. Yeah. I was the first 11, yeah. quite early in my entry to Lenan. I believe, yeah. I think I was in Form 1 by the time I made the first team, yeah. Form 1 or 2. Yeah. And it's not because I was a great cricket player, yeah. but it's because there were people not playing cricket. Ah. And uh, having come from St. George's, we yeah. played cricket in St. George's. Yeah. So getting into Lenana, yeah. uh, to just have, uh, you know, the, the pride that you have played some game, yeah. I can proudly say that uh, I played cricket for Lenana School. Yeah. Though now when it came to competing with other schools, yeah. I don't really think we did well. <laughs> because <laughs> it wasn't one of those uh, games that uh, a lot of emphasis was placed upon. Ah, and uh, now at this moment, when do you figure out I want to be a Wakili? Uh, becoming an advocate or a lawyer was not something which came early in my life. Yeah. I did my uh, from one to four not quite knowing what one wants to do. At that particular point, 
We had a system where the secondary school was from one to four, yeah. and then the high school from five to six. Ah. Okay. Though Lenana yeah. was neither a secondary school nor a high school, uh -huh. it was Lenana school. <laughs> and uh, why do we? Why was it Lenana school? Uh, because it was a finishing school. Yeah. It wasn't a secondary school. Yeah. Neither was it a high school. Yeah. It was just Lenana school. Yeah. And uh, we Lenana alumni call ourselves. We were a finishing school. Yeah. So from one to four, you would study a wide range of subjects. Yeah. And uh, there were a mixture of both the humanities, the arts, and the sciences. Yeah. And it is at the time when you sat for your O-level examination yeah. that, uh, you know, you would, did, you know, from how you performed, yeah. you'd go to form five, either studying the sciences, which would be physics, chemistry, biology, yes. or uh, and maths, yeah. for those people who also wanted to become engineers. Those yeah. were deemed to be the science subjects. Yes. Or the humanities, what we call the arts, yeah. where there was a wide range of subjects where one did the fine arts, you did the uh, literature, you did geography, you did history. Yeah. Uh, some people also did maths, you did geography, yeah. you know, basically the humanities. Yeah. And your choice of whether you will, uh, of your ultimate career, would yeah. depend or will be shaped at that particular time yeah. by the options you took, whether you wanted to do the sciences or the arts. Yeah. I did the arts yeah. and uh, my subjects of choice were, I did literature. Yeah. I did geography, I did economics, yeah. and I did fine art. Ah. Oh. Yes, I did four principal subjects. Yeah. People used to do three principal subjects. Yeah. I did four principal subjects uh -huh. for my love of uh, fine art. Yes. Yes. So even at that time, mm -hmm. uh, a choice hadn't, I mean, I hadn't quite made up my mind what I wanted to do. Yeah. But at, from five and six, I had, uh, we had our economics teacher. Yeah. Mr. David Anderson, mm -hmm. who also doubled up as the rugby coach, a very popular mm -hmm. teacher among students. Yeah. And th through his influence, yeah. we had very many people uh, in that class, yeah. economics class, choosing uh, s you know, a career subject at the University yeah. of Nairobi, or Bachelor of Commerce. Yes. So when we wrote our A-level exams, yeah. when I was called to the University of Nairobi, yeah. I was called to the Bachelor of Commerce class. Oh. And uh, some of my classmates in that class uh -huh. was uh, we had James Mwangi of Equity. Ah. We had uh, Linus Gitai, the chairman of Diamond Trust Bank. Yeah. We had Arbin Dungo. Yeah. We had uh, fellows like uh, uh, Frank Shebesh. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Fredo Diamba. I mean, people. Very many people who I'm really proud to say were my classmates. classmates yeah. Then from uh, from the uh, the commerce class, I stayed there for just about a week, mm -hmm. and I must say I was traumatized by the maths, <laughs> and I then left yeah. the commerce class and why opted started dabbling with the idea of probably studying architecture. Yeah, but while doing my research, I found that. These architects, they really work hard. Yeah. <laughs> Many a times, they sit overnight to meet project deadlines. Yeah. And that wasn't my idea of what took me to university. Yeah. Sitting overnight over the weekends, mm -mm. I mean, there had to be a work-life balance. balance yeah. I'm one of those guys who started that work-life balance way before it became fashionable to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So I gave that a skip, mm -hmm. and I found myself in the faculty of law. Yeah. And as I was still making up my mind whether this is what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. uh, two things happened. One, mm -hmm. I had an uncle of mine, my father's younger brother, who was uh, a lawyer practicing in Mombasa, yeah. uh, the late Ibrahim Onyango Gola. Mm -hmm. He persuaded me, he encouraged me to study law. Yeah. But the other thing that also happened is that the time for transitioning from faculty had now closed, 21 days had passed. Yeah. So I found myself in the law class yeah. and hence that's where I am today. Ah, any memorable people that from, uh, from uh, campus in, uh, or in, lecturers? In class? Yes. 
Uh, yes, I mean, we had lecturers, we had great people who shaped us a great deal. We had uh, the late Okotho Gendo, yeah. uh, we had uh, Justice Aaron Ringera, yeah. uh, 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 Dr. Kamau Kuria, yeah. uh, or the late Okotho Wiro Bondi Ogola. Yeah. Gidu Wigai came at the tail end as a tutorial fellow. Yeah. Smoking Wanjala, judge of the Supreme Court, yeah. also came in mm -hmm. as a as a lecturer yeah. at uh, as we were leaving yeah. classmates i can boast of a couple of people you have professor phoebe okoa yeah. who's our who's a commissioner in the international law commission yeah. we have the late professor otieno dick yeah. who became a judge of appeal yeah. uh, right now judge musinga yeah. uh, daniel musinga Jamila Mohammed, Judge Jamila Mohammed is also my classmate. Yeah. Duman Derry, mm -hmm. judge in the court in the Employment Labor Relations Court. Uh, 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 we have William Asiko mm -hmm. in the corporate world. Yeah. He's right now uh, Vice President Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. And we have great practitioners. Yes. Kamodo Waiganjo, yeah. Taib Ali Taib. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, there are many, there are so many that if I don't mention them, it's not because uh, they didn't acquit them, they haven't acquitted themselves yeah. well, but it's because I am in a class which I am very proud of the people yeah. I was with. Ah, they did ah, well for themselves. Perfect. So during your years, did you guys used to go to Kenya School of Law? Or yes. Yeah. We were, we did a three-year course at the University of Nairobi. Yeah and all the faculties in humanities and social sciences, yeah. which include the faculty of law, yeah. were all domiciled at the main campus. Ah, uh, so there was yes. no Parklands? No, you? Parklands. You know, Parklands was government secretarial college. Oh. That's what Parklands was. Yeah. And uh, they were bullied out of it as the university was expanding. And yeah. the, the faculty migrated to Parklands after we had left, oh. some years after we had left. Yeah. So we then did three years at the University of Nairobi main campus. Yeah and then one year at the Kenya School of Law. Yeah. And the Kenya School of Law was then off Valley Road. Ah. Uh, you know, it was a small class. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was mandatory that uh, when we got in, uh, Tudor Jackson was the principal. Yeah. But then he left while we were there, and the late Justice Leonard Jaggi yeah. uh, took over from him. Yeah. But what was interesting about our entry to the Kenya School of Law, which was a one-year course, yeah. is that we were expected to be residents. In that small In the small place. Yeah. And it accommodated us. Yeah. And for a long time, I never understood why we had to be residents. But apparently, yeah. as a Tudor Jackson once told me, because I opted to be a non-resident and I had to put a very spirited application yeah. to be a non-resident. Yeah. And it was not for any other reason other than the fact that by being a non-resident, yeah. you had an extra 1,000 shillings which was given to you <laughs> as a, yeah. an allowance for being a non-resident. Yeah. You know, the allowances we got at the School of Law is that your pupillage uh, farm would pay you anything between 750 shillings yeah. and 1,000 shillings yeah. as your monthly allowance. Wow. And then the School of Law paid you, gave you a stipend yeah. of another 1,000 shillings. Yeah. And if you're a non-resident, there's an additional 1,000 shillings. Yeah. So for me, with 3,000 shillings, yes. you know, I was pretty wealthy. Yeah. And uh, it could, uh, it, I was then living, uh, we were, I was living, my father had given my brother and I a house to live in, yeah. our old house in Arabi West. Yeah. So it was really, it worked out very, very well, well for me. you. So the school of law, we spent three months in class yeah. and nine months doing pupillage. pupillage. Yes. Ah, fun fact. It's the first time today I've had that fact of getting money. Yes. We've n I've never <laughs> had it. No, we were paid to study and uh, we still complained. You know, uh, both at the university <laughs> yeah. and at uh, the School of Law. We were paid hey. to study. Jeez. <laughs> Did you, you, you guys had a bar there? Because... In our no, days, we have a yes. see somewhere. No, there was a bar across the road. Across the road? No, across the road, there is a, there's a compound which today has a wall around it. Yeah. And it's part of the Department of Defense. Oh. Then it was not part of the Department of Defense. Yeah. It was the Grosvenor Hotel. Ah. There was a hotel which was there. Yeah. And further down the road, yeah. as you go towards town, yeah. where the Integrity Center is, yes. 
That was also a nightclub. I hear. There was a small little club, yeah. nice, cozy, white house. Yeah. It was called Starlight Club. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was, uh, one would go up there for drinks. Yeah. And uh, with the allowance we got, we could also go to Pan Africa and the Serena. Oh, jeez. Yes. You guys were having it. And, uh, you know, at that time, there was price control. Yeah. So even the price of beer was controlled. Yeah. And the difference between what was called a Class A hotel, which yeah. is really a, a Class A establishment, yeah. which was really buying beer off the shelf of a shop yeah. and drinking it in your car, mm -hmm. and Class D, yeah. which was the five-star hotels, yeah. the difference in price was not that much. Yeah. So in good times, you'd find students uh, having been uh, paid their stipend. Yeah. We we'll find their ways to the Serena and those kind of places. Hey. <laughs> so uh, you get done with that. Um, now, where do you go for people? Where does your journey uh, begin? Yes. I go to uh, then what we refer to as the oldest law firm. Yeah. And of course, uh, the partners of Hamilton will not agree with me. But uh, I still maintain the oldest law firm was Dali and Figgis uh -huh. Advocates. Yeah. And uh, I go there, I'm interviewed by David Ruffman, yeah. who later left. David Ruffman was also a partner at various times between Dali and Figgis. He was in Boy and Ruffman. Yeah. He was at also Hamilton, Harrison and Matthews. Yeah. And I think he was also with Salim Danji. I mean, he's, yes. I think he's one, one of the practitioners who... Maybe you should look for him because he probably give, he's the most experienced partner, yeah. having been a partner in very many <laughs> law firms. Yes. Okay. So then I start at uh, uh, Dalian Figures, yeah. and uh, I, I, you know, I chamber under David Ruffman, yeah. uh, a fellow who I learned a great deal from. Yes. Just other than, you know, uh, learning the practice of law. Yeah. You know. Uh, he was, uh, you know, we would talk a lot about the history, yes. especially the civil rights movement. Ah, and yeah. uh, we read a couple of books mm -hmm. which were of uh, mutual interest. Yeah. So Dali and Figgis was my starting point yeah. into practice. Yes. Yes. And then from Dali? Dali and Figgis, I, I, I qualified, they offered me a job. Yeah. But then they put me in some department. I think it's probate and administration. Yeah. And you know, my idea of being a lawyer yeah. was really uh, going to court. Yeah. I never before doing uh, before coming to chamber Dalian figures. I never for one moment thought that a lawyer sits behind a desk yeah. and does transactional work. Yeah. So my passion was to go to court. Yes. So one day I meet uh, James Orengo. He yeah. had just come back from exile. Yeah. And he had started a law firm up at uh, Ajip House. Yes. And he, you know, I tell him what I'm doing and I tell him I have an interest in doing litigation. And he tells me, uh, I'm looking for uh, an assistant. Why don't you come and join me? Yeah. So I moved from Dali and Figures after just probably a month, a month or so. I don't think I stayed long. Mm -hmm. I resign and I go to work with uh, James Orengo. Yeah. A boutique firm that was doing a lot of things. I mean, from uh, human rights cases yeah. to criminal cases yeah. to civil cases. Yeah. Anybody who walked through that door was fair client for us. Yeah. Yes. So I hung down with Jim Morengo for about six months or so. Yeah. Six months, and uh, I go out on the streets yeah. trying to find out whether I can set up myself. Yeah. But eventually. Yeah. I end up at uh, Oraro and Rachir Advocates. Yes. That would have been about 1989, 1990. Yeah. Uh, having, remember I was admitted at the bar in December 1988. Yeah. So about 1989, towards the end, 1990, early, I joined Oraro and Rachir Advocates. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you, you're still there? I'm still there. Yes, it was. It's been an interesting journey at Oraro and Rachir, Oraro and Rachir Advocates, yeah. which later became Oraro and Company Advocates. Yeah. I first start from the office at the East End. Mm -hmm. You know, as we say, today I am in the office at the West, West End. end. <laughs> yes, 
is it West Wing? Yeah. Uh, East Wing and West Wing. Wing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we are three associates who came from the same class. There was myself, mm -hmm. there was uh, Kiyogora Mutai, yeah. and there was Joa Bapopo. Yeah. And out of those three, mm -hmm. I'm the only one who has lasted this long. Yeah. Great team. Mm -hmm. I joined. Uh, it's a it's a law firm for the first time. You know, I am exposed to a big working environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dalian Figures was big, yeah. but now I am in litigation, yeah. a big working environment. Yeah. I'm working under Oraro. At that particular time, the partners were, there was uh, George Oraro, yeah. there was Ambrose Rachir, yeah. there was Aaron Ringera, a retired judge of appeal, yeah. and there's the late John Ugo. Ah. Yes. So it was a four, uh, you know, a four-person partnership, yeah. and then a couple of years later, yeah. two more partners are admitted. Yeah. Uh, the first lady partners mm -hmm. in the firm of Oraro and Rachir. Yeah. This is uh, uh, Mrs. Josephine Mangi, who yeah. still practices yeah. under the law firm of J. K. Mangi and Company Advocates, yeah. and uh, Anna Misabur, mm -hmm. who was a conveyancer. Yeah. So then there are six partners. Justice Ringera then resigns when he's uh, appointed to the bench yes. as a judge of the High Court. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, during that time that I am also made a partner. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we then uh, practice until about 97, 98 yeah. when Ambrose Rachir retires from the partnership. Yeah. And the name then is changed from Oraro and Rachel Advocates yeah. to Oraro and Company Advocates. Yeah. And uh, we then uh, continue practicing. Our managing partner is then the late uh, John Ugo, mm -hmm. a real great lawyer. Yeah. In fact, I keep on saying that uh, his demise was a great, was a big loss to the profession. Yeah. I mean, John Ugo was, uh, we. The late uh, J.R. Kowade used to refer to him. Yeah. That's James Ratiri Kowade. used to refer to John Ugo as Mutakatifu Johanna. Uh -huh. <laughs> because when you talk about a person who had work ethic, a person who, who loved the practice of law, a person who was a stickler to the law, that was John Ugo. Yeah. In fact, I always share this story, and you'll permit me to do so By all now. means, by all means, yeah. Uh, John Ugo, and I always tell my students this because further down the interview I will tell you that I'm also an adjunct lecturer at the, at the Stockholm University. Uh, yeah. I always tell my students yeah. this story. John Ugo was such a diligent lawyer yeah. that two stories are told about him, and I witnessed them. Yeah. There was one time John didn't appear before Justice uh, Busiri, Samuel Busiri. Busiri yeah. And when he didn't appear, mm -hmm. the other side was praying for adverse orders, uh, which ordinarily would be granted in the absence of any opposition. Yeah. And Judge Busire said that if John Ugo is not here, yeah. there must be something wrong. Yeah. And there must be a good reason why he's not here. Yeah. So I will adjourn this matter yeah. and will mention it tomorrow. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'll ask you to serve him with a notice. Yeah. To appear before me tomorrow. Yeah. That never happens. Yeah. A judge will never hold brief for a lawyer. Yeah. And uh, of course, the next day, John Ugo came and profusely apologized. There had been a misdiarising of the matter. Yeah. And that's how come he didn't know about yeah. it. And then another instance yeah. on a Friday, the court was full and we were before Justice Leonard Jage. Yeah. And various matters was called. And when John Ugo's matter was called out. I think he was about number six or seven. Yeah. The judge asked the parties whether they were ready to proceed. Mm -hmm. And uh, very, very surprisingly, and very unlike John, John stood up and said he wasn't ready to proceed mm -hmm. and he was praying for an adjournment. Yeah. And when he was asked for a reason, he told the judge that he was tired. <laughs> and the whole court burst out <laughs> laughing. I mean, yeah. no, no such excuse or reason had ever been uh, a basis for applying for an adjournment. Yeah. So, of course, the other lawyer stood up and 
uh, mounted a very spirited opposition to the application, yeah. stating that that is not a good enough reason. And Judge Jaggi, for those who know him, he had this wry smile. He just smiled listening to this lawyer, and then he told the lawyer to sit down. Mm -hmm. He then told the lawyer that I have so far adjourned all the matters which were called out before your matter. Yeah. And a variety of reasons mm -hmm. were advanced seeking an order for adjournment. Yeah. And I granted those uh, applications to adjourn the matters. Yeah. But I can tell you that however eloquently those applications were made, yeah. however convincing they may sound, yeah. you know and I know that they were far from the truth. Yeah. This is the first application which yeah. has been made, yeah. which is anchored on a true reason <laughs> that counsel is tired. <laughs> and for that reason, yeah. the judge adjourned the matter, but yeah. with a caveat. Yeah. He warned the rest of us in court not to try it at home, yeah. that he will not accept. He's only accepting it because it's John Ugo. Yeah. And John Ugo, yeah. as we today say, yeah. was a truthful man. Ah, yes. Good flowers. Yep. Yeah. So, um, You've, you've been at uh, various uh, positions at uh, the firm of Oraro and Company Advocates. Yes. And nowadays what we see, we see a lot of um, young lawyers, you, you, you get admitted to the bar, you maybe do a year or two years at wherever you are, and you bolt off and go and you set up your own practice. What has kept you long there? Why have you never thought <laughs> of setting your own practice? No, it's not that it's a thought that hasn't crossed my mind. Yeah. Uh, some, you know, soon after I joined Oraro and Company, yeah. about 1991, I believe, 91, 92. Yes. Uh, one evening, I walked into Mr. Oraro's office, yeah. Friday, and uh, I had the script all set out. I was going to give him my resignation letter, mm -hmm. and from there, I was going to go off to the carnival where some friends were waiting for me yeah. for us to celebrate my resigning yeah. and going into the next phase of my life. Yeah. And when I walked into his office, it yeah. was about 5 p.m. Yeah. I gave him the letter mm -hmm. and he didn't open it. He asked me, what is it? Mm -hmm. And I told him my resignation letter. Yeah. And he told me to sit down. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and he told me, I know why you want to resign. Yeah. You think that I'm pushing you too hard. Okay. And he told me, yes, I'm pushing you very hard. Yeah. And while, you know, he told me that he, he picked a rubber band which was on his table. And he started stretching it with his fingers. And he told me, Chacha, this rubber band, its use and value is only how much it can be stretched. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is the same with potential. Yeah. He told me, Chacha, you have a lot of potential yeah. which you are not utilizing. Yeah. And it is for that reason yeah. that I am stretching it. Yeah. Potential is useless unless it is stretched. Yeah. So he took my letter, threw it in the bin and gave me a file <laughs> and told me he wants uh, an opinion on it by 8 p.m. And here I am. Yeah. I am quitting because this guy is pushing me too hard. Yeah. Friends are waiting for me at the That's carnival. carnival. Yeah. And he's telling me yeah. <laughs> that... You're not quitting. Yeah. Take this file and work with it. And I went back. Mm -hmm. By the time I walked to my office, yeah. I was thinking about it. And I thought, probably he's right. Yeah. And uh, I went. I delivered the file to him mm -hmm. at 8 p.m. And he told me, let's discuss it tomorrow morning, Saturday. Yeah. Come to the office. I'll be here at 9. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. And yeah. Saturday, he didn't even ask me if I had plans. But I came. Yeah. And as I say, mm -hmm. two things happened. One, he has never responded to my letter of resignation. Up to date. Up to date. <laughs> and two, <laughs> through that process, yeah. I have uh, I, I, uh, moved on to become a partner. Yeah. And in 2009, yeah. managing partner. Yeah. And two years ago, I uh, became the senior partner. Yes. Yes. So as, as we're still on that, um, on that Oraro, Oraro story, so that we don't lose it. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's a time you guys had um, a merger, yes. sort of a merger. That's 2014, about October. Yes. We yes. had uh, things, we don't know what happened. Ah, okay. Yeah. No, uh, 
we were we had been thinking in terms of uh, expanding our law practice yes and we from our end yeah. we were we were studying various we were studying uh, various uh, options or how to go about it yeah there was of course the option the first option is to grow organically yeah uh, the other option was to invite in other partners yeah and there's also the other option of a merger yes the firm of hamilton harrison and matthews was a, is was and still is a very well established firm yeah having been around for very many years about a Probably century a century yes yeah. With them, yeah, we would bid for especially commercial work. Yes, would bid together. I think we did uh, divestiture of Kenjin together. Yeah. We did Mumia Sugar together, mm. and uh, we may have done one or two other matters together. Yeah, and they would also, whenever there would be conflict on their side, they would usually recommend us ah. as the go-to firm. Yes, and we had friends. I mean. Great friends, Kimani Kirago, who was my my classmate at uh, university and the School of Law, who admitted on the same day. Yeah. Uh, there was Richard Omuela, mm -hmm. who we lived with at Nairobi West together. Ah. Yes, at okay. the time when he started work. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, Ken Fraser. Yeah. I mean, there were a bunch of uh, people who we got on very well. Yeah. So we started thinking that, hey, Oraro and company, you guys have a emphasis and uh, uh, you know strength in litigation yeah hamilton <coughs> they have strength in commercial yeah why can't we you know put our separate strengths together yeah. and work and the discussion that we had with hamilton is not that we we uh, the proposal was floated i can't remember which side it came yeah everything was uh it was a good fit yeah the only thing which we never ad uh, we never quite addressed yeah. was the different cultures of the farm. Ah, they okay. had their culture, yeah. which had served them very well, yeah. and which uh, had brought them to where they were. We also had our culture, which had also served us well and had brought us where we were. Yeah. So when we got in, yeah. uh, when we now got under one roof, though we were operating in two different locations. Yeah. Uh, the litigation people were operating from the town location, that yeah. was ICA building, yeah. and uh, the transactional guys were operating from ACK Garden Annex. Yeah. When we now got together, yeah. it came apparent as we were relating that yeah. uh, we had, you know, uh, different cultures in our approach towards practice. Yes. And how, yes. So, recognizing that these cultures were so deeply entrenched on both sides yeah. and while we were still on honeymoon yeah. and we were still great friends yeah. we thought probably we should retrace our steps to our yeah. our initial position and that's what happened in fact when we discussed a demerger yeah. it took less than 40 minutes mm -hmm. yes it took less than 40, 40 minutes, minutes on a sunday morning yeah. i recall our on saturday uh, the decision was made on a Friday. Yeah. Saturday, I was unable to, I, would, I wasn't going to be uh, present because I was driving to Arusha. So yeah. I went to Arusha, mm -hmm. came back, and Sunday morning, we had a quick meeting. Yeah. 40 minutes, it was agreed, yeah. and we were able to form a small committee yeah. and, uh, you know, work out uh, how the demerger should take place. Yeah. And I'm happy to say that in spite of that, we remain good friends. friends yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, Kimani uh, Kir uh, Kirago Kimani remains one of my closest friends. Yeah. Richard Omuela remains a very good friend. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, and that's how it should be. Yes. Yes. So, um, you have all that experience. And yes. Because um, this is a show that is uh, very big on mentorship. Yes. Folks were asking me, and um, I, this question is going to be three phase, so yes. you can you you will find a way of uh, going around it. One, how do you, as as a young advocate, as a young lawyer, how do you put you, how do you look for clients? Second thing, 
how do you position your farm to be in some of these uh, panels? Okay. And then the last one, let's talk about your suits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, there's really no one answer to any of uh, those questions you've asked. Yeah. The first one you asked about young uh, lawyers. Yes. How do they get how clients? Do you, how do you, yes. Yes. Uh, when I started practice, yeah. I recall there was, I had lunch at some French restaurant, which was then domiciled at the ground floor of Mindeleo and Awake House. I was mm -hmm. taken yeah. for lunch by some very senior lawyer who, has never, who doesn't practice but was a minister in the government of Kenyatta mm -hmm. and later government of Moi yeah. and was chairman of Kenya Airways mm -hmm. for many years. Yeah. This is Isaac Edwin Omolo Okero. Yeah. He took me out for lunch and uh, I remember two pieces of, three pieces of advice he gave me. Yeah. One mm -hmm. was that the, the best time to learn is when you're young. Okay. So take this period and try and learn as much as you can. Yeah. And then the second one he told me is your outward appearance, yes. whether in form of impressing somebody in a conversation yeah. you may have met in a function or in a setup, you can impress the person yeah. by your conversation. Yeah. But that can only open the door for you. Yes. For you to remain in the room and remain on the table, yeah. it is the quality of your delivery yeah. that will keep you in there. Yes. And then the third one, he told me, yeah. always remember, you are the lawyer. Yeah. And as a lawyer, yes. your role is to advise. And in advising, your client's role is whether to accept your advice or not. not yeah. But in rendering your advice as a lawyer, yeah. you must always remember that it is the dog that wags the tail. Yes. And it is not the tail, the tail that, that wags. wags the dog. Yeah. So I looked at him quite surprised. What do you mean? Mm. He says, you know, many lawyers have turned themselves into a mouthpiece for clients. A client tells you, go to court and say ABC, mm -hmm. or I want you to do a certain transaction in a certain way. Yeah. The client might be right, yeah. but the final call comes, is upon you as a lawyer yes. to make that call. Yeah. So that's how you say it, it is the dog that wags the tail. Yeah. Then, how do I advise young people? Yeah. Uh, People, there are people like my uh, my founding partner, George Oraro, yeah. hardly worked for anybody. He was in Kaplan and Stratton, yeah. didn't stay long, and then went out, started briefly with Orengo and Oraro Advocates. Yeah. Not many people know that Jim Orengo and George Oraro are partners. I'm, already, I'm also hearing for yes. the first time. That's history, which yeah. is good that we can capture. Yeah. He then uh, worked also from the streets, mm -hmm. having no office. Yeah. And then finally he was with Oraro and Rachir, yeah. where they started the farm, yeah. which today is called Oraro and Company yeah. Advocates. Yeah. And for him, he tells me that the thing that he had to uh, always bear in mind yeah. is that the mere fact that you're a lawyer yeah. and the mere fact that you have opened some chamber somewhere, yeah. that in itself will not bring in work. Yeah. Work, you must first of all be able to inspire confidence of people. Yes. And that confidence is only inspired by your deliverables and how you conduct yourself. Yeah. You see, uh, today we live in a different world, yeah. the world especially of social media. Yeah. And I've seen a great deal of time the social media tool yeah. is very useful yeah. and can also be very destructive. Yes. One must be able to choose in what respect you want to use the social media. Yeah. You can use it in a way that you are not having what is called persuasive, uh, a persuasive advertisement of yourself, yeah. 
but more of an information, yeah. informative advertisement of yourself. You are telling people, I am so and so, I practice here, and these are my areas of practice. Yeah. And this is my experience statement. I've done ABC. Yeah. But when you tell guys I'm the greatest lawyer, mm -hmm. or you have a problem, come to me, I'll resolve it. Yeah. You know, the way you will find in the States huge billboards yes. telling you, remember that divorce, mm -hmm. that was me. Yeah. You know, so one must be careful the content that you share on the social media. Yeah. And also when you get an opportunity yes. to do work for a client, yeah. one, there are clients who love their privacy. Yes. I have seen many people at times discussing what their clients' cases, either in a social setup yeah. or at times even in social media. Yeah. That is a no-no for clients. Yes. Clients would like to retain some level of uh, privacy. Yeah. So once a client gives you work, mm -hmm. the client will judge you by your deliverables, yeah. the quality of your deliverables. Yeah. Of course, there are other people who get work in other ways, either chronism yeah. or other considerations. Yes. But if it's a serious client, that client who will be with you from the time you start your office yeah. to the time you're retiring, yeah. It will be based on the quality of your work. Yeah. And also, the other thing it will be based upon is, you know, your integrity. Yeah. I mean, some time back, some client who I am doing some work for mm. called me. And the work I'm doing for him is uh, a work which uh, is a, you know, a family dispute where uh, the family enterprise the family differences have come into the business and we, you know, uh, we've now got a stage where one part of the family is in, the other part is out of the business. Yeah. And as we've been fighting it for a while, yeah. a long while. Mm -hmm. So sometime last week, I believe, mm -hmm. he called me up and he was telling me something completely unrelated to what I'm doing for him. Yeah. He started asking me about another case I am doing for another family. Yeah where there are disputes yeah. and he says that uh, I know you're acting for the other side but my friend who's on this side yeah. would like to meet you mm -hmm. and tell his side of the story mm -hmm. so I looked at the guy and I told him look here you know the guy has a lawyer yeah. and I'm happy to meet his lawyer yes and the guy said no he just wants an informal meeting a quiet drink somewhere yeah and I found it a completely unacceptable request yeah so then I asked this guy that you know uh, friend I am acting for you yeah. in almost a similar matter. Yes. How would you take it if you heard that your cousins on the other side yeah. have approached me that we have a drink yeah. for a quiet discussion yeah. so I can hear their story? Yes. The guy paused and told me, Chacha, I apologize. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. So I told him, I am happy to discuss with your friend's lawyer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And for me, mm -hmm. as I've always told you, in your case, a settlement which is negotiated is oftentimes a much better settlement, yeah. a much better way of resolving the matter yeah. uh, than a court decision. Yes. Because a court decision may give you a victory, yeah. but it may damage the relationships which would otherwise have been yeah. uh, taken care of yeah. in a negotiated settlement. Yeah. So I tell young lawyers, yeah. you can get through that door. Yeah but your deliverables will determine yeah. whether you remain in that door. Yeah. And the other thing, always remember that if as a lawyer you are used as a conduit mm -hmm. to influence a case dishonestly yeah. or corruptly, yeah. always remember that at one moment your client will ask, how can I trust you? Yes. If I could use you to corrupt an outcome. Yeah. How can I sleep with a comfort that somebody won't offer you a more uh, alluring yeah. uh, incentive yeah. to, to uh, do me in in my own case? Yeah. The thing that remains your, what one calls your anchor, yeah. which will serve you whatever the circumstance, Yes. is your integrity. Yeah. And let me tell you uh, 
uh, something about clients. Yeah. When a client corrupts their way through a case yeah. and they use the lawyer yeah. or even use a judge, yeah. you know, they will always, they love the idea of when they are sitting somewhere, they talk about their influence. Yeah. Say, they will talk about it. Yeah. So they may have gotten a positive uh, result as a result of inducing yeah. the process, yeah. but ultimately yeah. they will talk yeah. about how. Yeah. They'll talk about you. Yes. They say, you know, that lawyer, a good friend of mine, we can use him. He knows the judge. judge. <laughs> yeah. So at the end of the day, yeah. know that uh, you may have some short-term result yeah. of getting a result yeah. which you are happy about. Yeah but it will have destroyed yeah. your reputation. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've not talked about your suits. Oh, my suits. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's... Who makes your suits? Well, there's a young man called uh, Sidney Owino. Ah, I know Sido. Sartorial, yes. Sartorial, Sao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Sao. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, as I say, for a long time, I mean, these are the young people who I really admire yeah. people who are making great use of their talent. Yes. And indeed, it was just yesterday I was talking to, to uh, some friends yeah. and I was telling them yeah. about we need a society yeah. today yeah. that recognizes talent, talent yeah. and rewards yes. talent. Yeah. And when we have these young entrepreneurs, yes coming up. We need to encourage him. Yeah. And that's how I met Sydney. Ah. Somebody just recommended to me, just yeah. give him a try. Yeah. I went to his shop at Adam's Arcade yeah. and uh, you know, he really looked like a creative. You know, yes. you see Sydney yeah. and uh, very confident of himself yeah. and uh, very well spoken yes. and very courteous. Yes. And I uh, gave him a shot. Yeah. And uh, we've worked with him since then. Ah. Yes. Ah. And in fact, I always tell my wife this. My wife presently is writing her PhD thesis yeah. and she's doing something of, on entrepreneurship. Yes. And she's also very, very passionate yeah. about young people yeah. who are setting out there yeah. and exploiting their talent yeah. in order to earn a living. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there's this general consensus in the young bar yes. where we constantly say that uh, there are very few gentlemen at the senior bar. Yes. And almost everyone agrees. And so one of them is you. How, <laughs> how, how do you remain humble, courteous, opening, giving opportunities to young people, holding their hand, not feeling... I mean, you, you've done all these things for young... How do you able to ground yourself? Uh, first, I'm humbled. I mean, for you to tell me that it's not something which I really think much about. Yeah. But uh, it's very kind of you yeah. uh, to at least share this. Yeah. I'll tell you that um, I really don't know the answer. Uh -huh. But probably it's, it might do something with upbringing. Yeah. Uh, I do have parents who instilled certain values in us. Yeah. And also at the time when I eventually started work, yeah. my founding partner, George Oraro, yeah keeps on telling me that in life you don't go up by pushing other people down. Yeah. You pull each other up. Yes. And at the end of the day, yeah. you will have a great profession yeah. or a great firm. Yeah. You know, many people think that the only way they can get up is that you must engage in a vicious competition yeah. with your opponent. Yeah. And the way to do it yeah. is to push them down yeah. rather than you know, each of you state your case yeah. and uh, have, you know, at the end of the day, it's an enriching experience. Yeah. My passion with young people also comes from the fact that I was one time a young person. Yeah. And uh, I'm now 59. Okay. And uh, some people say that I am still young. Mm -hmm. I suspect that they do so to, to massage my ego. <laughs> <laughs> but I have gotten where I am because there were people who are older than me yeah. who thought, who held my hand yeah. and walked with me. Yeah. George Oraro is one of them. Yeah. 
uh, my own father yeah. was one of them. Yeah. People like Fredo Jambo, yeah. the late Joe Quach, yeah. those are people who invited me to have tea with them. Yeah. You know, we used to have a tradition. Yeah. When we come from court, you would, uh, you know, you would go for coffee. Yeah. And some of these people who are older than us yeah. would call us to their table. Yeah. And uh, you would sit, and it was almost like the way Socrates was teaching people yeah. in the streets of Athens, yeah. where, you know, you sit and just by the conversation, yeah. you would learn quite a bit. Yeah. And these people are people who, you know, I to date owe so much to them. Yeah. The way they treated me, yeah. I owe it to the other people. Yeah. And indeed at times uh, I would tell my wife that, uh, you know, she would ask me, how was the day? I said, ah, my case didn't go on. Yeah. And she tells me, does any case go on? Mm -hmm. So I tell them that actually I leave the office, yeah. that I'm going for coffee. Yeah. My passing through court is merely yeah. uh, the excuse to get to the coffee shop. Yeah. So the reason I'm leaving the office yeah. is to go for coffee, yeah. to be taught by these seniors. Yeah. So we would go to court, it would be a short matter, the matter might not go out. Yeah. You would go to some restaurant, either Trattoria or Pasara, yeah. and you'd find them there. And yeah. I recall quite early, there was a time I offered, I had gone for tea with uh, Mr. Oraro. Yeah. And when the bill came, mm -hmm. he checked his coat and realized I'd forgotten his wallet. Yeah. And I offered to pay the bill. Yeah. I had money yeah. and he told me to keep my wallet away and he told, he called the manager yeah. of the restaurant, that was Trattoria, yeah. and told him he's sending somebody with the money. Yeah. And later yeah. I was to learn, and Joe Quach told me this, yeah. that he doesn't pay the bill because he has more money than I, yeah. but because that is part of our tradition yeah. in mentoring yeah. the people coming yeah. behind us. So, so I should go for whiskeys with you. Like no, it's tea. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and I think the the rule applies between eight and five in the evening. It's something different. Yes. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Ah. So um, um, there was also the question about um, the senior bar yes. not participating in a lot of LSK activities. Yes. Yes. It's a sad state of affairs. Yeah. I do recall. Uh, the last time when I, I can put a finger where the rain started to beat us yes. is there was a general meeting, yeah. I think the Los Adi calls it ordinary general meeting, yeah. which was held at the Intercontinental. Yeah. And there was a lot of, every time somebody stood up to express their position on a matter, yeah. there was a lot of booing and heckling, yeah. something which was very alien to those of us who had been around for a long time. Yeah. I mean, today there are differences between members of the law society mm -hmm. on various matters. Yes. And these differences is not to say that we didn't have them when I joined the profession. They yeah. were always there. Yeah. The only difference yeah. is that there was some decorum yeah. and courtesies extended to one another yeah. while we were expressing our diverse yeah. uh, positions. Yeah. So, uh, the Law Society has for a great deal, and it's a pity and I hope we can be able to reverse this. It yeah. has become what one calls a majoritarian, yeah. uh, a majoritarian society, mm -hmm. where the majority will have their way and will have their say. Yeah. They will not give the minority the opportunity mm -hmm. to even be heard or even to hear some counsel yeah. from some of these people. Yeah. So because of that, you find that people are, uh, you know, they, they won't wake up on a Saturday to yeah. go for a meeting. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you won't have your say, you won't have your way. Yeah. And all that will happen is that uh, you will come out of that meeting very disappointed. Yeah. Though there has been efforts, a great deal of efforts by some of either council members yeah. of the society or even uh, some of the presidents. Yeah and chairman, yeah. who will specifically reach out to the older lawyers and invite them for a much more structured session, whether it is uh, in some of these conferences they will call, whether it's in 
the continuing legal education, yeah. or even functions just to come and talk to these people. Yeah. Yes, the mentorship sessions. Yeah. I've seen, uh, I was seeing there is coming up some induction for young lawyers yes, coming yes. up. Yeah. And I was looking at the list of people invited. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy that at least uh, some of the senior lawyers yes. are being given a platform, a safe space where yeah. they can also speak to the younger people and also mentor these younger people. Yeah. So the rain is still beating us some time back, it's still beating us, but I'm, I am still confident yeah. that a time will come when we will be able to get back our old society. Yeah. And let me also remind, tell you that uh, we're also young lawyers one time. Yeah. The only difference yeah. is that we, you know, uh, we, were, we, only, we observed decorum yeah. in our interaction. Yeah. I do recall uh, my late friend Nani Mungai, yeah. one time at an ordinary general meeting, yeah. we were debating the question of uh, advertisement by lawyers, yeah. you know, and for a long time, you recall, marketing and advertisements were never permitted. But yeah. now yeah. there are some, uh, there is permitted levels which you can advertise. Yes. Nani Mungai at that particular time was, uh, he was in a startup, yeah. him and his partner Murio. Yeah. They were, I think, in townhouse. That's yeah. where they started from. Yeah. Small little cubicles. Yeah. And the motion, the way it was crafted, yeah was obvious that it was targeted at people who ran personal accident claims. Yes. Personal injuries claims, yeah. personal injury claims. Yeah. And they were using polite words to describe these people. Yeah. And Nani Mungai stood up mm -hmm. and said, please don't call us those fancy names. Yeah. Just call, call us, us ambulance <laughs> chasers. Because <laughs> that's what we are. Uh, <laughs> you know? And he gave a very spirited uh, uh, submission yeah. that this motion as crafted was discriminatory yeah. against those who practice the personal injury claims. Yes. Because they were targeting those people who are chasing that business. Yes. And he said, but there are other people mm -hmm. who chase business on the golf course, in the clubs, in other places where we personal injury lawyers can never be admitted. Yeah. So if we're going to discuss this, yeah. let's discuss it All holistically. Yes. Yeah. So as I recall, and to date I still remember yeah. that thing. Somebody telling Nani Mungai that you, I agree with you. Yeah. And uh, we need to discuss this thing holistically. Yeah. But always remember yeah. that one day you'll also be a senior lawyer. Yeah. So even as we craft this thing, yeah. Uh, the motion height ought to be or the resolution. Yeah. Let's always remember that we never remain young lawyers all our lives. Yeah. So when we are we are uh, attending to the affairs of this society, yeah. let us not just look at it as of today. Yeah. Let us think about it. Will this serve us even when I transition from being a young lawyer to an older lawyer? Ah, now we're almost coming to a tail end. Uh, one, how do you, what advice would you give uh, this year, that young lawyer fresh into the job market? They're, they're trying to find their niche. I don't know wh what kind of area I want to practice. Um, I want, I want, to, I badly want to buy a car. Uh, you're in that transition. So what advice would you tell them? And also you could tie it to having been a managing partner at Oraro and Company. When you're hiring, what, what skills are you looking at? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think the two questions are, have the same answer. Yeah. What we look for and what advice. Yes. One, uh, we look for somebody. I mean, I always advise people. And this is something uh, George Oraro told me quite early when he was telling me about uh, stretching my full mm -hmm. potential. Yeah. He asked me how old I was. I think I was probably 27 years. Yeah. And he told me that God giving me life and health, yeah. I'll practice probably until I am 65, 70 years. Yeah. And for some, even beyond that. Yes. 
he mentioned that there is nothing as painful yeah. as coming to a job which you hate yeah. and doing what you hate. Yeah. Your future is many more years than where you have come from. Yeah. So first and foremost, you must fall in love with the job. Yes. You must love what you are doing. Yeah. So when you are thinking about which area of law you want to practice, yeah. don't practice in an area merely because the rewards are great yeah. or it is an easy area. Yeah. Practice in a place which you are passionate about yeah. and which you will enjoy practicing. Yeah. And there was a time when uh, Dr. Robin Mogere, yeah. uh, who's a urologist, calls himself a plumber, <laughs> once told me, he's also yeah. an old boy of Lenana School. Yeah. He told me that when a person is entering the job market, whatever yeah. market it is, mm -hmm. whatever profession it is, yeah. the two choices you have mm -hmm. is, are you in it for pursuit of money? Yeah. Or are you in it for pursuit of excelling in that calling? Yeah. And he answered his own question. Mm -hmm. He told me that research has shown mm -hmm. that those people who enter into a profession mm -hmm. in pursuit of money, yeah. many of them make the money, yeah. but do not necessarily get the satisfaction. Yeah. And uh, it is, you make the money, yeah. you don't excel in <clears throat> what you're doing, yeah. and then you hit the glass ceiling. Yeah. Beyond that, there's nowhere else you're going. Yeah. And uh, there's just how much money one can make. Yeah. But for those who have gone for pursuit of excelling in their calling, yes. they have worked patiently yeah. over a period of time. Yeah. And as a result of the result of their hard work yeah. and their commitment to what they're doing, yeah. money has followed them yeah. as a consequence. Okay. And with that, they've been able mm -hmm. to be leaders in their professional market yeah. and have been handsomely rewarded yeah. for the good work that they are doing. Yeah. So they get satisfaction yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. And they are not defined yeah. by the money that they have. Yeah. They are defined by their contribution to their profession yeah. and by where they stand in terms of excellence in their profession. Yeah. And there's nothing as unfulfilling yeah. as being defined by either the amount of money you have yeah. or the size of the car you drive yeah. or the suburb that you live in. Yeah. All those things are things like Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. They are things which are vanity and they go. But one thing somebody can't take away from you yeah. is what you create within yourself yeah. in terms of your calling and in terms of excelling in it. Yeah. So what is my short answer to the young people? One, mm -hmm. you have age on your side. Yes. You have so much time ahead of you. Yeah. You can choose to make your money, but I can assure you, mm -hmm. you'll hit, you know, you hit the glass ceiling so quickly yeah. and you will find that there's nowhere else to go yeah. after that. Yeah. There is the other option you have mm -hmm. where you can build on your... You can build on your profession, yeah. excel in it, yeah. and ultimately the reward will come. Yeah. So you will have both the profession in your hand and the reward on the other hand. Yeah. So when I'm looking for somebody to employ, I'm looking for somebody mm -hmm. who is in this thing for the long haul. Yeah. And I'm not saying you stick with me. Yeah. Even if you are just passing by, yeah. I play my role in molding you yeah. and you move on. Yeah. I want to see that fire burning in your belly. Yeah. So uh, earlier on, as uh, you began your journey, I picked on a number of things. You said you, you lecture at the yes. Strathmore Law School. Yes. And uh, you also said you, you figured out the li uh, life balance, um, work-life balance. Yes. A long time ago. Yes. And uh, we're in a phase where, especially men, yeah. all we know is work, 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 work until you drop dead. Or work, 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 work. Then you develop uh, other things. You, you, you start. Yes. You are drinking too much. You there's all that. You know. So, besides besides the practice, what else do you do? 
Uh, I try spending time with uh, not just my family. Yeah. And when I talk about family, I talk about the nuclear family and yeah. my extended family, my siblings. Yeah. Uh, I lost my father about nine years ago. So yeah. my mom, yeah. I visit her quite often. Yeah. My cousins and also friends. Yes. And uh, I also teach. Mm -hmm. And why do I teach? Yeah. When Professor Franceschi, Louis Franceschi offered me a teaching role at the Strathmore University. Yeah. I asked him why me? Yeah. And he told me I want you to mentor mm -hmm. the young students. Yeah. So you're not just teaching them what the book offers them, yeah. but you're teaching them. Yeah. You're also mentoring them. Yeah. And I must say I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, three months in a year, I, I report to Strathmore. Mm -hmm. I do tw twice a week. Yeah. And uh, it gives me a lot of satisfaction yeah. being able to just chat with, uh, with, with these uh, kids. Yeah. There was a time, and when I say kids, I don't mean they're children, yeah. I mean they're young adults. Of course. Yeah. So um, when uh, Louis Franceschi gave me an opportunity, yeah. it's been very satisfying. Yeah. Not too long ago, I had an encounter. Yeah which just confirmed to me that uh, interacting with these young adults, especially in a class setup, and there are 150 of them, two yeah. classes of 75, 75, 75 yeah. is for a good reason. Yeah. I met a young lawyer yeah. who insisted that he wants to buy me tea. Yeah. And I reminded him that I would like to have, he reminded me he was my student. Yes. Then I told him, yes, that is good, but it's me who's going to buy the tea. Yeah. He pleaded with me that, please, let me buy you tea. Yes. So I smiled and I asked him, so where do you want to take me? Mm -hmm. He told me to choose where I want to go. Yeah. And uh, I thought, I said, okay, fine. Uh, is Fairview okay? Because Fairview is next to my office. Yeah. He said, yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was thinking of Fairview. Yeah. So we met at Fairview. And while having tea, he yeah. then mentioned to me that... The reason why he wanted to buy me tea yeah. was to share a testimony with me. Yeah. And he reminded me that there was a time I came to class. Yeah. And during that time around uh, the Nairobi, there had been many young adults who had been uh, taking their lives, yes. taking away their lives, yeah. committing suicide. Yeah. And on that day I came to class, yeah. completely off context, I started telling them of a story. Yeah. That, and it was a story actually when I was build, when we were building yeah. uh, this place where I live. Yeah. I had gone, I lived in Kilimani and I had passed by Adam's Arcade. Yeah. There used to be a shop there called Daily Visits. Uh -huh. I passed and I was buying, you know, uh, I, I went to buy specifically loaves of bread and packets of milk because yeah. I was coming to the building site yeah. and the workers, I thought I should uh, at least buy them lunch. Yeah. Then as I was leaving the shop, this young man, young boy, yeah. probably 13, 14, came to me asking me for money. Yeah. And he was generally one of these homeless kids, yeah. you know, the, what we often refer to as, as the street kids. Yeah. He then asked me for money and I could tell that he was sniffing glue, which yeah. was concealed under his T-shirt. Yeah. Then I asked him, so you want me to give you money mm -hmm. so that you go and buy more glue? Yeah. And the guy cockily told me yes. Mm -hmm. So I was quite taken aback by his candor. Yeah. So I told him to follow me. Yeah. So I went to my car, mm -hmm. I opened the boot, yeah. and I had five liters of glue, which I was bringing to site. Yeah. Contact glue. Yeah. Then I told him, there is glue, you can take it. Yeah. The guy looked at me mm -hmm. and looked at the glue, and looked at me yeah. and looked at the glue. Yeah. And then he told me, we mze, yeah. unataka kuniua. <laughs> Ata kama na tesekana, yeah. napenda maisha yangu. Yeah. So, I laughed yeah. and I gave the guy a packet of milk yeah. and a loaf of bread. Yeah. And every time I found him at Adam's Arcade, I would buy him yes. some milk yeah. and a bread. Yeah. So I was telling these kids in my class mm -hmm. 
But that child lives on the rough. Yeah. Doesn't know where the next meal is coming from. Yeah. Doesn't know what his future holds for him. Yeah. Doesn't even have a place to sleep. Yeah. And the only clothes he has is what is on his back. Yeah. And yet he values his life. life yeah. You young people, mm -hmm. I can tell by you sitting in my class, yeah. you are much more privileged than that young man. Yeah. So all I will tell you mm -hmm. is that even when you think that you are having a rough season, yeah. there are people who are having a rougher season yeah. and they still value their lives. Yes. So this young boy, who my student, who now is meeting for tea, yeah. told me that before I shared that story with them, yeah. he had been thinking of taking his life. Yeah. And he told me, Molimu, thank you very much. You saved my life. Yeah. So my teaching yeah. as Strathmore, my interaction with young people, both within the profession and out of the profession, yeah. I always take it that it is a calling for me yeah. to be able, I can't walk through life, yeah. learn through many lessons in life. Yeah. And the day you bury me, yeah. all you tell me, talk about is how much uh, wealth accumulated yes. through my journey in life. Yeah. I would be happier if somebody spoke how I positively impacted on their lives. Yeah. That would be the greatest tribute yeah. I would I ever have if somebody was to yeah. choose yeah. to uh, share a tribute yeah. in respect of my life. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. So what, what's the most memorable thing you've ever had or experienced in court? In court or in a litigation? In a litigation. Okay. Most memorable and uh, you know many times uh, when you talk to a lawyer yeah. you will expect the lawyer will tell you the greatest case he ever did was this multi-billion case yeah. which he won or which you know there was a huge contest. But I'll tell you the one that I'll always remember yeah. was uh, when I was quite young in practice, just joined practice. Yeah. My uncle who had persuaded me to become a lawyer mm -hmm. was practicing in Mombasa. Yeah. And a friend of his, a Ugandan fellow who used to take care of his uh, books of accounts, yeah. his sister who was an illegal immigrant mm -hmm. was working for a family mm -hmm somewhere in Parklands. Yeah. She was a live out a house help. She yeah. didn't live in the house. Yeah. And the arrangement was that she would come in at eight o'clock. The lady of the house would open for her. Mm -hmm. She would work and at five she'd go away. Yeah. One day she came at the appointed hour, just around eight, mm -hmm. and she noticed a heavy police presence yeah. within the compound. Yeah. So she took off mm -hmm. because she was an illegal. Yeah. She then went away, roamed around, then came back. Yeah. About 10 o'clock, the coast looked clear. Yeah. So she walked in. Mm -hmm. And when she got in, yeah. there were still some policemen around the nab down. Yeah. And she didn't know why they were arresting her. Yeah. But it didn't take long before they told her that she had killed the lady of the house. Oh. She had murdered the lady of the house. Yeah. So she was charged. Yeah. So my uncle was telling me, please defend this lady for me. Yeah. It will be too expensive. I coming from Mombasa yeah. to do yeah. this case. Yeah. I went to see the lady yeah. uh, when she came for her mansion in the basement of the court's this, uh, cell basement. So I, I waited for the day the case came up for mansion. Yeah. And I went to take instructions from the uh, cells, which were the basement yeah. of the courthouse. Yeah. She gave me her story. Yeah. I was unable to really figure out what our defense is. Yeah. But something told me this lady is innocent. Yeah. When the trial began, yeah. uh, the first witness was the husband yeah. of uh, the deceased, yeah. who then mentioned how he had left the house at 7 a.m. in the morning yeah. to take their only child to school. Yeah. And for some reason, which he didn't include in his statement, yeah. he came back uh, that he had forgotten certain things. And yeah. that's when he found his wife had died. Yeah. He conceded that the only way the house help yeah. would get entry to the house yeah. 
is if the lady of the house had opened for her yeah. because it was locked from inside. Mm. And uh, I then asked him whether the lady had an insurance and he was fidgety about it. He didn't want to answer, but the court compelled him to answer. He said, yeah. yes, she did. Yeah. The insurance then was for an amount of five million. Mm. When I asked him about him, he, his insurance cover, life policy was for one million. Yeah. The lady was a house, was a housewife. Yeah. He was the one who worked. Yeah. I then asked him, but tell me, if you were to die, yeah. then your family would lose their source of income. Yeah. And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. But if your wife was to die, yeah. uh, you would lose a mother in the house and consortium, but the income would still come in because of uh, your business. Yeah. So rather than answer my question, he said, tell me how much he loved his wife. Mm -hmm. So I reminded him that if the wife was to die, yeah. she wouldn't get that five million. It's you who would get the five yeah. million. And the guy kept on insisting he, he insured her for more money than him because he loved his wife. <laughs> so other witnesses came, mm -hmm. but the witness yeah. who, who uh, cracked the case was yeah. the pathologist. Yes. When the pathologist uh, said testify, yeah. I noticed from his report, yeah. the, uh, the pathologist, uh, the pathologist report yeah. estimated time of death by the he said by the time he did a post mortem first he came to the scene was a police pathologist yeah. and then the body was moved to the morgue yeah. where he <coughs> he did the the, the investigatory uh, post mortem. Yeah. I asked him when he came to the scene what time he had come. He told me about nine o'clock. Yeah. Had rigor mortis set in, yeah. he told me rigor mortis had set in mm -hmm. and the body had again relaxed. Yeah. So what was the approximate time of death? He thought, he hadn't thought about it, he yeah. said probably 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. Because rigor mortis sets in, I think, in four hours yeah. and then I think it relaxes. I can't remember what time he said, but his it, approximate time of death was some time deep in the night. night yes. So I asked him, so by 7 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. this lady was already dead. Yeah. He said, yes, she was already dead. Yeah. I was dead. Yeah. But you recall, the lady's husband yeah. had testified that he left the house at 7 in the morning. Yes. And that this house help comes in at 8. Yeah. And it required somebody from within the house to open yeah. the door. Yeah. And again, he had he had uh, testified that there was nobody else in the house other than him, yeah. his wife and the child. Yeah. So for me, the case was done. Yeah. When judgment came, yeah. the, ju the magistrate, because she was charged over the violence, mm -hmm. the magistrate found my client guilty and it crushed me. I was asking myself, how possibly, yeah. with all that evidence? evidence. Yeah. Then I told uh, my instructing client that, no, no, we'll have to appeal. Yeah. And this poor man told me that, Mr. Advocate, you have been doing this case for us. Mm -hmm. We've not even paid you. Mm -hmm. We can't even pay you. Yeah. How will we pay you an appeal? Yeah. So I told the guy, no, no, it's not the money. We will do this appeal. Yeah. We did th that appeal, mm -hmm. and it was before a two-judge bench. Yeah. And uh, I argued it, and the judges agreed with me. Yeah. And said, police picked the wrong person. Yeah. And acquit, quashed the yeah. conviction. Yeah and I released my client. Yeah. My client didn't come to court on that day. Yeah. You know, the way uh, the prisons didn't bring her to court. Yeah. So my uh, the instructing client mm -hmm. and I then jumped into a Kenya bus. Those yeah. days, bus number 14 used to go to Langata. Yeah. There was number 14 to Langata, 15 to Southlands. Yeah. So we jumped onto a bus number 14. Mm -hmm. We got to Langata prisons to deliver the good news to our to my the, the lady I was representing yeah. and we were kept waiting for a while before we were called into the office in charge of prison the office yeah. the guy then told me uh, sorry this lady fell ill yesterday mm -hmm. took her to Kenyatta mm -hmm. hospital yeah. and uh, the hospital has informed us that she died so you know from that celebratory mood that we had won a case, yeah. it turned into a pyrrhic victory. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it really stung me. Yeah. From there, of course, 
arrangements now had to be made to release the body yeah. and to transport the body back to Uganda. Yeah. I, w I then was converted yeah. from uh, an advocate in the case, a yeah. lawyer in the case, to part of the funeral <laughs> committee. It was yeah. the family were not yeah. uh, well resourced. Yes. So for what I could, you yeah. know, not that I had money, yeah. but the little that yes. we had, you know, give a little money here and there. Yeah. Got a few friends yeah. and we were able to, the morning that they were leaving for Uganda from the city mortuary, yeah. I was really downcast. Yeah. And this fellow who had instructed me, yeah. the brother to the deceased, yeah. came to me and told me, mm -hmm. Mr. Advocate, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah. I am happy that I can now take my sister yeah. back home and yeah. bury her yeah. as a free person yeah. and not as a convict. Yeah. And that thing, I always remember it, that even in difficult times, yeah. this person was able to see that silver lining, yeah. that he could take his sister back as a free person yeah. as a, and not as a convict. Yeah. And I always remember that case, mixed feelings, you know, sad that the lady never enjoyed her acquittal, yeah. but always happy yeah. that she was buried as free. a free person. Yeah. So, well, hey, that's a story. And you're also one hell of a storyteller. <laughs> so, um, what's next for Chacha Odera? Well, uh, God giving me life and health. Yeah. Uh, probably have another 10 years of practice. I'm 59. Yeah. Probably by 70. Yeah. The same age judges retire. Yeah. I should also retire then. Yeah. Uh, in between now and then, mm -hmm. I hope that I can be useful in mentoring yeah. younger people. Yeah. And also just making my contribution, not just to the profession, yeah. but to humanity. Yes. That's really what I look for yeah. in the next phase of my life. That's a very loyal answer. <laughs> <laughs> says a lot but nothing <laughs> <laughs> so this last segment is uh, very 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 simple and fun mm. uh, whiskey or wine none none touche um, Johnny Wilkinson Danny Cutter yeah I don't drink okay okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Messi, Ronaldo. I don't watch football. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it to be my list. Uh, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. my younger son, yeah. who you will see in a bit, yeah. he was a footballer. Yeah. One day he asked me, why don't you watch football, Dad? Yeah. So I told him, I'm still yet to understand yeah. how a stadium packed with 50,000, 60,000 people yeah watch 22 grown-up people yeah. chasing around an inflated piece of leather yeah. for 90 minutes. Yeah. And the guy laughed and, uh, yeah. well, let's put it that uh, I really don't have any, uh, I'm not one, uh, probably I don't have a long attention span. Oh. It's, it's, yeah. And also sitting yes. uh, anxiously waiting for the end result. Yeah. So what I always do, yeah. in the morning when I wake up, and I usually wake up early because I'm in the office by 6.15, 6.30. Yeah. I flip through the channel and I see the highlights of what mm. happened. So by the time I get to the office, yeah. as people are discussing it, last night's football match, yeah. I can also tell them, yeah, those three goals were scored by ABC, yeah. but I didn't watch the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. ah, yeah. uh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. There's something we do on this show. Yes. We, we call it uh, the wall of fame of Wakile Kweko. Uh -huh. So please ah. do us the honors i'm trying to see if i can recognize any of the signatures uh, <laughs> that's the beauty of it data protection yeah yeah thank you asante sana <laughs>